Welcome to Lesson 3D, Buoyancy and Stability. In this lesson, we define the buoyant force on a submerged body and how to calculate it. We discuss Archimedes' principle, and then we talk about stability of boats and ships. Consider some arbitrarily shaped body. I like to call it a potato. The body has some weight, which acts at the center of gravity, which is also called the center of mass. If this body is submerged in some fluid, that can be a gas or a liquid, there will be pressure forces acting normal along the entire surface of the body. Our workhorse equation is shown here, from which we know that the pressure at the bottom of the body is larger than the pressure at the top. This results in a net buoyancy force, which is the resultant force by integrating all these pressures over the area. This buoyant force acts at a different location. We'll call it C. C is the centroid of the volume. We also call it B, or the center of buoyancy. Archimedes' principle is relevant here. It states that the buoyant force acting on a body immersed in a fluid is equal to the weight of the fluid displaced by the body, and it acts upward through the centroid of the displaced volume. This is the key part for our case. The buoyant force is the density of the fluid, the density out here, times g, times v sub sub, which we define as the submerged portion of the volume. In our case, the body is fully submerged, so v sub is the same as the total volume. Why is Archimedes' principle true? Well, let's draw this same object, this potato, but as an imaginary object immersed in the fluid. In other words, it's not really an object, but just a chunk of fluid with this kind of imaginary boundary. The pressure distribution on this body will be identical to what we had for the real body. For this imaginary body, the density inside is the same as the density outside. So the weight of this imaginary body is rho f g v sub, which we see is the same as the buoyant force on our real body. For the imaginary body, f b must equal w, since everything's in equilibrium. After all, it's just an imaginary body. It's really just a chunk of fluid. Since we have the same pressure distribution and the same body shape, we see that Archimedes' principle must hold. For our real body, let's let the density be rho b, and then the weight is rho b g times v. This v is the total volume because the weight of the object doesn't depend on how much of it is submerged. In this first case, however, the body is fully submerged, so V sub and V are the same. The net downward force will be W minus FB, where we'll use these two equations. Let's do an example. Suppose we have a sphere of a given diameter and a given density falling into a tank of water. Let's calculate the net downward body force on the sphere due to gravity. Let's draw our sphere of diameter D and some buoyant force FB. If this sphere is falling in the water, there will also be a drag force. But at this point, we're only concerned with the net weight, or the net downward body force. Let's call the net downward body force F. F is simply W minus FB. W is rho of the body, G, times the volume of the body, which is pi d cubed over 6. The buoyant force is rho FG times the volume, by Archimedes' principle. We can combine these terms to get our answer in variable form. We plug in our numbers. The difference between the body and the liquid density, g diameter cubed over 6. Our usual unity conversion factor, our final answer is 0.598 newtons acting downward. Since there's a net downward force, this body will sink. If this were negative, the body would rise. For example, a plastic sphere that is lighter than water. Since we're talking about statics, you would have to have some kind of string attached to this sphere holding it in the water or perhaps a scale weighing this sphere. And you would find that the net force is 0.598 newtons downward. Now let's consider partially submerged bodies or floating bodies. Here's a picture my son took of one of his friends floating on the Dead Sea. In general, we have some body with density rho b or rho body and some fluid with a density rho f or sometimes I'll spell it out rho fluid. And this body is only partially submerged. I'll call that portion of the volume v submerged or v sub. The total volume is just V total or V. There will be a total weight of this body, and W has to include the entire body, volume V, but the buoyancy force acts only on the submerged portion. We'll call that FB. The weight acts on the total volume, while buoyancy acts only on the submerged volume. If this body is just floating there, not moving, not sinking, then we have to have a balance of forces. By the way, we're neglecting air pressure on top. There will be some small effect due to the air, but for most liquids like water, rho F is much bigger than rho air, so it's safe to ignore that effect of air. The balance is that FB equal W, and we can analyze this as follows. 
the buoyancy force is rho fluid g times the volume that is submerged. W is rho body g times v total. The g's cancel, and we can write an equation for v submerged over v total, in other words, the portion of the body that's submerged by volume, and it turns out to be rho body over rho fluid. For a floating body like this, rho body has to be less than rho fluid, so this value is less than 1. Let's look at ice as a common example. An ice cube floats in a glass of cold water. We want to calculate the percentage of the ice cube volume that is above the water. Well, let's sketch our ice cube and the water surface. This portion that's above the surface is what we're talking about. The other part of the ice cube is totally submerged. We look up the densities. The density of ice is about 916 kilogram per cubic meter, and the cold water density is about 1,000. This is rho body. This is rho fluid. Our equation is V submerged over V total is rho B over rho F, which gives us 0.916, or 91.6%. So 91.6% of the volume is submerged. Therefore, only about 8.4% of the ice cube is above water. We have similar results for floating icebergs, where only about 10% of the iceberg is above water. The rest of it's below water. We can use this kind of analysis to our advantage. There's an instrument called a hydrometer, which is an object that is placed in a liquid. It's heavy at the bottom, and it will sink until some level where, just like our ice cube, the weight of this hydrometer matches the buoyancy force. There is a scale on the hydrometer. This one has a specific gravity of about 1.012 or so. If the liquid were denser, this hydrometer would move up, and the specific gravity reading would be larger. So we see that a hydrometer is a simple instrument to measure the specific gravity of a liquid. Of course, once you have SG, you can easily calculate the density of the liquid. Now I want to briefly discuss the stability of ships and boats. First of all, a review of what we mean by stability. I like this simple analogy that everyone can understand, the ball on the floor. If you have a floor shaped like this, this ball is stable. If we move it some distance, it will return to where it was. That's stable. The neutrally stable case is shown here. If we move the ball some distance, it just stays where we put it. The unstable case is shown here. If we move the ball even a little bit, it will keep moving and fall off. That's unstable. That helps us understand the stability of bodies. Let's look first at fully submerged bodies. As we defined previously, we have a center of gravity G and a center of buoyancy B, which is also the centroid of the submerged portion of the body. G depends on how the weight is distributed inside the body. For example, if there's a weight on the bottom of this sphere, G is lower than the middle. And if there's a weight at the top, G will be higher than the center. This case is stable because G is below B. This case is neutrally stable. And this case is unstable because G is above B. The bottom line is written here. The body is unstable if its center of buoyancy B is below the center of gravity G, which is this case here. This is for the case of fully submerged bodies. What will happen is this body will flip over until it becomes stable like this one. Now let's talk about ships and boats. These are partially submerged bodies. I'm going to do just a qualitative analysis here. When a boat tips to one side, we call that listing. Think about what happens as in this diagram. When the ship is aligned vertically, we can do a hydrostatic analysis to find a resultant force on the ship hull. An equal resultant force will act on the opposite side of the ship, so there's no net sideways force. There's a weight and a buoyancy force as previously. Now what happens if there's some listing? We do our hydrostatic analysis on this curved surface, and we get some FR on this side. You can see that these two volumes are not the same, and the shape of the hull that we're analyzing is also not the same. This right side of the boat is deeper, so FR on the left is not equal to FR on the right. The line of actions are different also. If there's a restoring moment on the boat due to this non-symmetry, the boat will right itself up again, and we call that stable. If there's a net clockwise moment on this diagram, the ship will keep listing and eventually capsize. The math to figure this out gets a little bit tricky. There's something called a metacenter, which is the point where the line of action of the buoyancy force before rotation and the line of action of the buoyancy force after rotation intersect. This is the line of action before rotation, right through the middle of the boat, which we also draw here. But the new line of action, combination of both of these forces, is here, where those meet is the metacenter. For a case in which M is above G, the boat is stable. If M is below G, the boat is unstable and will overturn or capsize. The bottom line is written here. 
a boat is unstable if its metacenter m is below the center of gravity g. As a practical application, you want to have your center of gravity as low as possible. So you put your heavy cargo, engines and fuel, etc. at the bottom of the boat. That makes it more likely that your metacenter is above your g. If you load lots of cargo on top of the ship, you have a better chance of being unstable and capsizing the ship since g is above m. To do an actual problem, you'd have to know the exact geometry of this hull, and you'd have to integrate to get the forces, moments, and lines of action. We won't go into that much detail here. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos.